Part of George Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue, the pianist was Martin James Bartlett, our guest this week, partnered by the London Philharmonic Orchestra, conducted by Joshua Weilerstein. And their new album, Rhapsody, is just out from Warner Classics. I'm James Jolly and welcome to this Gramophone podcast in association with Wigmore Hall, which this coming week sees appearances by the Chiaroscuro Quartet, Simon Trubczewski, Laura van der Heiden, Leon McCauley and Lucy Crowe. Full information at the end. Martin James Bartlett's Rhapsody is bookended by Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue and Rachmaninoff's Rhapsody on the theme of Paganini. And in between, there are solo pieces either by those two composers or in arrangements by Earl Wilde, as he explained the programme to me. Looking at the repertoire on, the, on this recording, it's like a meeting point of so many different people. I mean, obviously, well, the first meeting point is Gershwin and Rachmaninoff. And the connection there by Rachmaninoff being at the premiere of The Rhapsody in Blue in uh, 1924. Yes, well actually, when I first came to the music, it was because of the connections I had with each work. So the Rachmaninoff Rhapsody I did for BBC on Musician of the Year, and uh, the Gershwin Rhapsody in Blue was my debut at the proms. So for me, they were very personal choices as to why I loved them. And then looking further, I wanted to include some solo works in the middle. And I love Earl Wilde as a pianist and as a transcriber. He's wonderful. And I knew because I played Fascinating Rhythms that he had transcribed lots of Gershwin's songs, but I didn't realise that he'd also transcribed lots of Rachmaninoff's. And I thought that was a perfect thing to have in the middle. And as you say, Rachmaninoff was at the premiere because he was a big fan of Paul Whiteman and the band which, it, which Gershwin wrote it for. And Gershwin himself was playing in that premiere. And that was 10 years before Rachmaninoff wrote his Rhapsody. So I did love that connection between the two. And also Earl Wilde didn't premiere, but he debuted the second orchestration of Groffe, which was with Toscanini conducting. Because he was Toscanini's pianist, wasn't he? Yes, he was. NBC Symphony Orchestra. Until sort of, I think, Horowitz sort of ousted him a bit when he married Wanda Toscanini and that partnership came up. But yes, so I loved that connection between the three of them and also in the middle of the album because I wanted to have a changeover point from Rachmaninoff to Gershwin there's the Rachmaninoff polka which he dedicated to Godofsky who of course is another Russian American virtuoso transcriber and I think that signals the change of mood from the Rachmaninoff to the more jazzy free nature of the Gershwin which then concludes the disc so I did love all of those connections across New York and, as you say, a meeting place was, I found really exciting. And when you do Rhapsody in Blue, you know, you've obviously got the choice of the different versions. You can have the jazz band original, mm. then I think it's called the pit band version, and then this 1942 version, the, the, the second of the Grofe yes. orchestrations. I mean, is that the one you've always tended to do because it has a bigger orchestra? Yes, I mean, I will be doing the jazz band version as well at some point, um, which is very exciting. It's a very different style of piece but I think I wanted to do a version that was as symphonic as possible I mean there are obviously massive differences between the Rachmaninoff Rhapsody and the Gershwin Rhapsody but I still wanted that sort of sweeping string symphonic sound that you get from his orchestrations which is really lush and full of depth I think So when you're approaching um, the Paganini Rhapsody, the, the Rachmaninoff work, it's, a, it's an introduction, a theme, and then 24 variations. Do you see the work sort of broken down into, into almost concerto movements, or do you just see it as one large expanse ahead of you? I think it's a combination of both. You definitely have to see the entire structure of the work. But from the beginning, it's amazing how he develops it. So you start with the motif of just the piano playing A, E, those two notes, and then a few others come in. But then in the second variation, then you have to add in all of the Paganini bits in between. So it's definitely a build up of ideas and of technique. So it does progressively get harder, which is quite nice because you get to warm up at the beginning just by playing a few notes. But the middle section, I guess, from variation 16 to 18 you could say, is sort of the slow movement, which culminates in that beautiful 
18th variation, which everyone loves so much. And then I guess from the 19th on to the 24th is sort of a, a mad, wild dash to the end, which is technically the last movement, I guess, of the concerto. And similar with the Gershwin Rhapsody, and in fact, on the album, we have split it into three separate tracks so that you have the, uh, the middle section is sort of the slow movement. You know, they were both clearly phenomenal pianists. I mean, Rachmaninoff particularly. I mean, what can you sort of tell about him as a pianist from the music he writes for the piano? Well, it is very pianistic, which is lovely to play. And actually, in some ways, it's similar to Mozart in terms of the way the runs are written is it fits so beautifully underneath the hand. And you can tell it's... It has been written by an incredible virtuoso themselves. The Gershwin is in some places a little bit more awkward. It's more of a technique, instead of fast passage work and virtuosity, it's more sort of jumps and movement around, which I guess is more of the sort of ragtime jazz nature that Gershwin played himself, a bit like I Got Rhythm. It's got those leaps in the left hand and things, especially in the middle section. But yes, especially with Earl Wilde, actually, his transcriptions they fit like a glove when you're playing them because it's obvious that a pianist of great technique has written them and it all makes sense and the way he's divided up elements to split between the hands, it's just a perfect way to do it. You don't need to alter anything because he has made it so convenient for one's hands to fit around the notes. So in that sense, it's a joy to play music that's so um, beautifully laid out physically. There's the, also the wild Rachmaninoff connection in that he recorded the Paganini Rhapsody himself as well. Yes, and they knew of each other, and I love the connections through it, and I think we really wanted to make an album that was cohesive in nature and had all of these things that were connected between them. And Earl Wilde is one of my favourite pianists and was absolutely fantastic, and I've always admired his technique and this sound he had that was so golden, and he had such a beautiful singing sound... Um, that was more of a Russian school of sound, sort of cantabile, than you sometimes get in American playing. So I think he was definitely very much inspired by the Russian school of pianism. I mean, are you drawn to the, the, the sort of, you know, that particular school of pianism, the, the sort of highly virtuoso romantic tradition, you know, so people like George Ballet or Tchaikovsky? I, but yes, I actually, my, the first album I listened to was Shura Tchaikovsky, and it was one of his encore albums. And it had the paraphrase on the Blue Danube. And I was absolutely entranced. And I think that's why, possibly, I was so drawn to the piano. Because the way he could make these cascades of notes sort of sound like water droplets and things. And so crystalline was his touch. And actually, I went to college and spoke to people and nobody knew of Shura Tchaikovsky. I mean, nobody had heard of him. Everyone knew of Horowitz, who's also one of my favourite pianists, of course. Um, but I am drawn to that. And actually, my first teacher after my mother was taught for a short period by George Bollett. And of course, George Bollett himself was taught by Godofsky. And then you go through, which is wonderful to see the lineage of Tchaikovsky and Beethoven, and all of that, um, which is beautiful. So Yes, George Bollett, Shura Tchaikovsky, Horowitz. But then I am drawn to sort of a more perhaps sensitive touch like Dino Lepati and things in certain repertoire. I guess it really depends on whether I'm feeling a bit frivolous and uh, <laughs> excitable or whether I'm a, a little bit more in a sort of gravely serious mood. Because, I mean, the great thing about Rachmaninoff is that, you know, he lived well into the recording age, so we actually have a lot of Rachmaninoff playing Rachmaninoff. I mean, is that is that good or bad for a pianist? I mean, is it good to hear how he does it? But then there's always the risk, presumably, of trying to imitate. Or... I think it's essential to hear, and one may not like all aspects of it. I personally think his playing is absolutely tremendous. But it's very interesting to note that he... Um, did things entirely different in performance to as he wrote. Some of the tempi, some of even the dynamics and phrasing marks are totally different in performance. And I think as a musician, we have to look at the hard copy of what he wrote as his intentions to probably be the purest sense of what he expected. But as we know, in performance, things happen and depending on nerves. And he was a very nervous performer as well. Speeds and things change and we're not always necessarily 100% happy 
or very rarely, in fact, with our performance. So I would say to people, especially musicians and myself, I listen to Rachmaninoff, I take great inspiration from it, but I don't try to play like him because I know that it's a very individual style that may have been in the heat of the moment, whereas what he wrote down we have to try and think is more sort of the gospel. Because there is something slightly surreal about a composer, pianist, being, as it were, scared of the music he wrote. You know, because there's that famous story about how he used to, I think it was Mozevich, told him to keep a glass of creme de menthe, sort yes. of, you know, just to sort of <laughs> steady his nerves before he got to the, the last variation of the of the um, the Paganini yes. Rhapsody. And you're thinking, but you wrote that. I know. And also, the thing I think is, of course, the, the last variation, 24, has these quite large leaps. But I imagine for Rachmaninoff, they weren't quite so large. Because his hands were enormous. His hands were absolutely humongous. I mean, uh, I think it's sort of one and a half octaves or something, really incredible, nearing two octaves. It's just, uh, which I'm sure had its own technical issues with that. Because, of course, the larger your hands are, the more fiddly, intricate things get. And the more expansive things are obviously easier to sort of, you can encompass it in your range. But yes, apparently he did down a shot of creme de menthe before every performance. I mean, I, I don't know whether it's quite right, but it's quite a fun story. I have to say, when I recorded the album, I was entirely sober <laughs> for the entirety of it. So you're, you're about to uh, set off to America for a, a tour. And this is a, a recital tour, so you're not doing any concertos. So, so what, what programme are you, you taking with you? So the programme I'm taking does have a few elements from the album. So it does have the Rachmaninoff polka, and it has vocalise and Where Beauty Dwells. But it's an interesting programme because I've tried to sort of encompass as much of piano literature as I can. So it starts with Rameau, the gavotte, and doubles, which is just such an amazing, amazing piece. And it's so ahead of its time. And it's really glorious to play it on a huge Steinway D, even if it may be entirely out of character and um, purists might think that's awful. I personally love it. So we have that French dance to begin with, then a Haydn sonata, which is very witty and sort of charming, as lots of his works are. But then we go to the other extreme at the end and finish with Ravel La Valse. So we have two French composers with their wildly different takes in different periods of a dance. And then for encores, I've actually, a, a, a very good friend of mine has transcribed a beautiful version of Deep River. And it's a, a jazz infused sort of ode to the piece, which I love playing and sort of have to stop myself from crying when I play it because it's just so heartfelt and beautiful. And, and presumably, like a lot of musicians, you know, your world fell silent for quite a long period over the last sort of you know, 18 months, two years. I mean, did you use that time, as it were, productively, or did you just pause? I mean, did you use it for learning new repertoire or thinking up new programmes and so Well, it was interesting because we started recording the new album, The Solo Works, at the end of 2019. So I had recorded half of the album then, and then we had this long break between recording the concerto things. In the midst of that, the piano, which I love to bits, um, which I recorded the solo things on, was dropped and the frame smashed, which was an absolute nightmare. So we had to find a new piano, which is actually the sister of the, the piano. They were made on the same day and have very similar serial numbers. So therefore, there was a long space of time to think about the album and to think about what it meant, how I would mix the concerto with the solo repertoire and sounds and matching things to be honest with you during lockdown I did a lot of eating and I did a lot of cooking <laughs> and I just enjoyed sort of getting lots of fresh air and, and reading and catching up on lots of things that I hadn't had so much time before to do but definitely listening to lots of recordings and um, just I mean my life is full of music all the time. Have you always been a, a sort of recording a recordings fan? I mean I, I find often I mean pianists in particular 
you know, have a fascination for old recordings and hearing, you know, what these, these legends sounded like. Yes, I mean, I always have been, but I'm not specifically the piano, actually. I, I very rarely listen to piano music. I usually listen to orchestral music, symphonies and operas, and this is what I usually have on in the background when I'm sort of pottering around the house. But, of course, there's an amazing nostalgia to hearing a pianist play on an instrument that may no longer exist and of music of an entirely different time. It's it's a quite an emotional thing to think about it, sort of that moment captured in time. Which is why I probably like like wine so much, because it's also a moment captured in a bottle, you know, that you can experience fifty, sixty years later, made by people who aren't necessarily around anymore and, and vines that will never grow the same way. And that's how I feel about the classical recordings as well. And going back to the, the album, I mean, with these these little works that sit between the two concertanti pieces, I mean, it's almost given you a, a, an incredible trove of encores to attach to either of the concertanti works when you perform them in concert. Yes, and they are really popular works, actually. I mean, Vocalese is wonderful, and a dear friend of mine who sings says that it's the only piece that he never forgets the words for, because it obviously has none. But and there are quite a lot of versions of, to choose there, from. There right are, there the actually. Well, there's Trifonov's version. And then there's the Zoltan Kochis. Um, there is, as well. But I think the thing I loved about Earl Wild, apart from just the connections, was how expansive he makes it. It transforms the piece. And he does these beautiful echoes in the middle. So we have the first theme with the melody on top. And then it comes back a second time with your thumb, your right-hand thumb underneath, playing the melody just a beat out so you sort of have this lovely counterpoint and then it comes back at the end with an even more beautiful descant over the top and he almost makes especially in the other work that is on the album which is Where Beauty Dwells which is sort of I think the original Rachmaninoff is How to Sweet the Spot or, he makes it sound French it sort of has this lightness that it could you could imagine that it might be Debussy or something which I think is an amazing thing to do to Rachmaninoff which is so Russian in nature. So yes, they are a great set of encores, especially in Embrace Bull You and The Man I Love and, and things. Would those sort of pieces ever take you off down, because there's an incredibly rich catalogue, I suppose, of operatic arias, operatic fantasies, you know, people like Nishakov and all those sorts of people um, who did these, you know, sort of fantasies on Visidate. Mm. I mean, does that kind of appeal? It certainly does, um, because... I do play the Wagner list Tristan and Isolde, which is absolutely wonderful. And of course he did Tannhäuser and he did quite a few others and so did um, rival pianists at the time and Godofsky. So it, I do think there is some merit in the future perhaps putting together an opera paraphrase, Rigoletto as well being one of them, and the Percy Granger rambles on Rose and Cavalier as well, which, so, is gorgeous. which is absolutely wonderful. It's fiendishly difficult. That would be a wonderful programme, I think, to put together, actually. So thank you for the idea. <laughs> yeah. So when you return from America, is your concert schedule sort of picked up a bit? And I mean, is it looking healthy? Thankfully, it has. It seems that when I get back from America, I might jump on the Eurostar to Paris the following day and do a concert in the Salle Coteau there and then back for two concerts with the London Philharmonic Orchestra of the Rhapsody on a theme Paganini. And yes, and then off to Switzerland a week later, I think. So hopefully, fingers crossed, it seems to be getting quite bustling and busy, which is so nice after a period of such barrenness. Um, Best of luck. Well, thank you very much. Part of Rachmaninoff's vocalese is arranged by Earl Wilde and played there by Martin James Bartlett on his new Warner Classics album Rhapsody, just out. Gramophone podcasts are given in association with Wigmore Hall. On Sunday morning, March the 6th at 11.30, the Chiaroscuro Quartet play Beethoven's Quartet in F, Opus 18, number 1, and joined by clarinetist Matthew Hunt, Mozart's clarinet quintet. 
That Sunday evening, live at 7.30 and streamed from 8, Solomon's Not give a programme of motets by members of the Bach family, Johann Christoph and his younger brother Johann Michael, whose daughter Maria Barbara married the great Johann Sebastian. Monday lunchtime at 1pm, broadcast on BBC Radio 3 and live-streamed on Wigmore Hall's website, the pianist Simon Trupczewski is joined by Georgi Dimchevsky violin, Sorin Spazinovici viola, Alexander Somov cello, Hidan Mamudov clarinet and Flatko Nushev percussion for music by Brahms, the third piano quartet, Guillaume Connaissance divertimento, arranged by Nushev for sextet, and Panda Shahov's quintet. On Tuesday lunchtime for International Women's Day and streamed live at 1pm, the mezzo Rowan Hellier with Sholto Kinnock Piano performs songs by Judith Weir, Kate Whitley and Olga Neuwirth. And in the evening at 7.30, vocalist, movement artist and composer Elaine Michener makes her second appearance this season with Women's Work, its title taken from the pioneering 1970s magazine edited by Fluxus artists Alison Knowles and Anya Lockwood, which featured text-based and instructional performance scores for 25 women artists. Tonight's programme presents contemporary works by today's women and female identifying composers. The concert will be followed by a conversation with Elaine Michener. Wednesday lunchtime at 1pm, the cellist Laura van der Heiden with pianist James Coleman plays music by Janacek, Kodai Dvorak, Vitislava Kapralova and Ondras Mihaly. And in the evening at 7.30pm, pianist Leon McCauley plays sonatas by Haydn, Mozart and Schubert, the A major, D959. On Thursday evening at 7.30, the British contemporary ensemble Apartment House play music by Daria Svevzdina, Helmut Oering, Michael von Biel, Orlando Gibbons and Jörg Frey, including two UK premieres. And on Friday evening at 7.30, the soprano Lucy Crow and pianist Anna Tilbrook perform songs by Schubert, Judith Weir, Her Natural History, Schoenberg's Opus 2 and Richard Strauss, his four last songs. Well, for more information and where to watch the concerts or catch up for at least 30 days, just go to wigmore-hall.org.uk where you'll find a host of archived concerts too. And tickets for April to July concerts are now on sale. Gramophone podcasts are free, but if you enjoy them, then a really great way to support our work is to take out a subscription to Gramophone magazine. Over 13 issues a year, we bring you hundreds of reviews by our expert critics, as well as in-depth articles about the latest classical music releases and the most exciting musicians of the day. And if you head over to gramophone.co.uk slash subscribe and enter the code PODCAST20 in the checkout, you can even get a 20% discount off any subscription package. We really value your support. And do look out for another Gramophone podcast very soon. <laughs>